Welcome to another Archan XP webinar. My name is Zoltan Toth. Over here is our resident architect, as always, Mr. Ilyas Bak. Hi there. Today's topic is a big one. We are going to look at file imports and how we can process data which is coming from another surface. Lots to do, so let's take a look. As always, I urge everybody to ask the questions that you might have on the right hand side. We are trying our best to answer them as we proceed, or if there's no time for that at the end, we are going to talk about them because there's a lot to discuss actually. Uh, when we talk about file imports, there are several <coughs> brands and kinds we could be talking about. So I'm going to give the word over to Ilish to illustrate what we are going to discuss. And I have a chart about the file imports. Yeah, Do you okay. want me to open it up? Yep, yes. yes uh, uh, we have this chart to explain what sort of file formats Social XP supports. This is not all, but the most important are here. Uh, as you May already saw this. Uh, Archline is very, very communicative with uh, with the, with the world, with with other professionals. Uh, you can import and export uh, file, several file formats to work together with uh, other professions, or you just simply uh, load new things to extend your libraries or uh, things like that. We will uh, pretty much cover most of these uh, file formats. First, we will talk about the most important file formats, such as the DWGs, which you can see at the top of this chart. Uh, we will also talk about the IFC uh, file formats. What uh, is that good for? What's the difference to uh, DWG uh, files and what sort of information that holds? And also we try to focus on uh, what sort of uh, kind of rules you should follow when you load uh, a content into Archline, what to take care of uh, when you work with those. We will talk about images, how to load them into Archline and, and for what reasons. Uh, we will also talk about PDF files and well, we will talk about quite a lot. So I, yes. I won't list all of them. Maybe you will see it. Uh, soon yes, we are show. going to go bit by bit. We are not <coughs> going to demonstrate all of these yeah. abilities, but this is just to show you that our client is, like you said, very communicative yeah. both ways. So I think the first step would be the DWG <coughs> and the DXF yeah. imports. And I think that's a very important topic, knowing that uh, almost all of the line based line work and projects are communicated with this format. Yes, right? yes. Uh, well, uh, even though uh, DWG is mostly used for uh, 2D documentation uh, communication, I mean, when uh, you have the ability in your in your any sort of software that you used already uh, to export the file, you very likely have the DWG mm -hmm. file format because it is uh, such a format that can uh, communicate most of the details uh, uh, in the 2D level. Sometimes also in the 3D, but it has a few limitations. Uh, so we will discuss uh, what sort of 3D file formats we, we, we offer for that. But when we talk about drawings, uh, when we talk about sections, when we talk about floor plans, that is very likely uh, be communicated via the DWG file format, which is a very old and very well established file format. So that's why it's uh, very well known all around. So when you receive um, um, a DWG file, and here I also mentioned that, of course, Archline is also able to save the DWG files, but now together, now today we, we talk about the imports. Yes. So uh, when you import a DWG file format, uh, it, is, uh, it, it will be uh, um, loaded as a, as a 2D drawing. So for that, I will actually load an, a new f uh, project because that is a very likely scenario that you will use that DWG file as the basis of your work. So I just created a new empty uh, kind of document, a new empty project in Archline. And now I have this uh, file here. Uh, we, have a, we have a folder for these uh, DWG files here. So I'm just uh, opening up the file explorer in, in Windows. Yes. And we will work uh, on, the, um, on the ground floor of a, of a project that we have. This is the, uh, the previously loaded project um, only in, in DWG file. The original DWG file is here. So when you load that, uh, you will just click and drag, or you can use the file import DWG file uh, option. And you will see this dialog coming up. And this dialog uh, tells you, uh, it, it actually shows the preview of this content. If it's not, not, a, not a very, very big uh, DWG file, it will show you uh, the, the preview by default. If, if not, then you can change this behavior here. And most importantly, it will be scaled accordingly, uh, according to the information that was very likely stored in the DWG file. Now, this is not uh, mandatory. I mean, there are DWG files that ho host this information, but some of them, they don't have this information there. So you have either the option to use the units that the software understood when reading the file. It, in this case, the software found that it was in millimeters, so it is very likely true. As we see this little ruler here, it tells us the size of this building, so it looks okay. 
Uh, but if not, uh, if somehow this is quite off or something like that, you can just either choose another um, unit or you can just tick here and use a, uh, you know, um, a multiplier. This is only metric, but what about feet and inches? That is also something that you will see when, if, if that loads in inches, then you will see this automatically loaded in inches mm -hmm. and then you will see this ruler adapt to that uh, scale. So if you are more familiar with that and uh, when you receive files stored in inches or something like that, the software will automatically switch to that. Now it's it's metric, so we will use the millimeters uh, default uh, settings. We don't change anything. And just to mention that actually there is an, a sub panel here that you can also uh, control. It has a few options uh, to um, to tell how the software understands this information. We now we go with the default, so that is uh, most of the time uh, absolutely fine. So I just hit OK. And then the software um, allows you to either place it with a new origin. Now I won't do that. I just would like to place it where it was designed to. So then the software loads the 2D and I have the 3D empty because this is only a 3D drawing. It has lines, groups and, and things like that in this uh, content. What happens with the layers that you imported? Uh, yeah, well, well, the layers uh, are automatically uh, red. Uh, they are automatically uh, completed here. You can see the uh, layer manager, which is uh, started from here. The layer manager has the layer filters for all the layers, the used layers, and the layers coming with the DWG file. Mm -hmm. I automatically named this filter as the original name of the DWG file, which is very handy because when you start working uh, with the project, now I will show you just to have a quick glimpse how to uh, process a DWG file. So uh, imagine that I'm creating the, the walls and I would like to later differentiate what was the part of the original DWG file and what's, the, what, what's, what's my design. This uh, filter uh, is there by default to help that. So um, let's say I'm, I'm fine with that. We see that we have all the layers, everything is okay. So now I show you what to do when you would like to turn a 2D line drawing like this into walls and, and uh, doors and windows. In that case, you use the walls and DWG drawing uh, command. And well, you can select any sort of uh, uh, style, but uh, for now, the width is not important because uh, we will actually pick uh, endpoints of a line and the, the parallel line, which represents the, the thickness of the wall, and it will automatically turn this into uh, a wall. So when I continuously do that, let's say um, I'm willing to just quickly. Um, yes, just the, the main walls. The great thing about this, few, uh, yeah. this feature is that you don't have to care about the wall thickness first of all. You just have to click on yeah. one side, <laughs> on both ending points or close to the end points, and then click the opposite side. And in that case, the width is going to be automatically calculated. Yeah. Now, Illish is at the moment working with a very conceptual early stage one layer yes. wall, but later on we can elaborate <laughs> that. The point is now just to show you how you can use the line work. And I think now is the time to talk about what happens with the openings, because we do have doors and windows here. Yes, uh, well, for that, let me just quickly um, create at least uh, a few one. Uh, yes. Yeah, let me just uh, quickly pick that. And for example, this uh, here, and well, that's enough. So now I have a door here, uh, which is represented as a double uh, uh, side door. I can actually elongate this wall to cover the, the, the other one if I just would like to represent this with one single uh, sided, uh, single leaf uh, door. So whatever the situation is, the, the door and the window has a similar uh, tool that helps uh, processing a DWG file, and that is the door by two points and its counterpart in the windows. It's the uh, window by two points. Both works the same. You pick two points on the drawing, and then, well, actually, you just set up the orientation of the door. And again, you can just uh, select something that you would like to, for example, place this into a partition wall in that case. Uh, so let me just restart that again. So I just use the door by two points and this will be in a partition wall. So I just click here and here and let's just uh, set it up. So now it's uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the displacement is a little bit different. So now uh, I have the door and the same way I digest all the doors and all the windows and then later I can change their style, I can change the color, I can change their size, but it is a very, very fast way to process uh, such a complex data like this. What happens if you have multiple floors in the DWG <coughs> or you have multiple DWGs with certain levels? So how do you brush them all together into one single drawing? Well, uh, in ArchLine, by default, whenever you start a new project, you already have a default floor system uh, with four different floors, basement, ground floor, first and second floor. 
Now these are empty floors where you can do whatever you want. You can draw uh, all sorts of items and you can import content onto that floors, onto those floors. So uh, imagine that now we have a, a first floor drawing. Now I just switch to the first floor, it's empty. It's, there's nothing here. And now I'm willing to load that content and that is the first floor uh, Elatanova start first floor mm -hmm. drawing. So I just uh, click and drag, import it here. And from this point on, everything works the same. Uh, I see the uh, scaling, I see the units, I see the, uh, the size of this content. I can change the uh, options if I want, or I can just leave them as they are. And then when I hit OK, and, and this is why it's important, I'm not placing them uh, manually. So if I don't do that, the software will automatically align them to the same place because they were exported from the same software. So they would overlap. Yeah, they were they would overlap. That's that's by default. If if the if the DWG file is correct, then it, they will uh, overlap. So now I have this here, and now I, by just simply switching the two floors, see now they are completely and nicely overlapping each other. Mm -hmm. And by just simply uh, creating one, at least one wall here at the top, so you will see how nicely the 3D as well is covering the, this part. You will see that this point and this point and this here makes makes a wall mm -hmm. uh, which is overlapping. Now I'm, I'm I need also to create a, a slab as, and, and uh, other things as well, but the the drawing is overlapping. And now I just quickly would like to refer back to the uh, layer system that you mentioned. That so now when I go back, it is easy to find what was part of the first floor uh, drawing. The, the, the ground floor drawing and my whole uh, other uh, drawing parts are on the other layers. One last addition to the CAD <coughs> imports is actually how do you export these things back into the DWG or the XF drawings. So yes. if you could load up the final stage of this model or another model perhaps, yep. then we could show how to well, we generate actually have that here. Yes. Um, a complex model with, with mm -hmm. several um, That's right. floors. So now, when if I would like to uh, save this into a DWG file or, or into anything, I can use the file and uh, an export. Export is when you would like to export the, uh, save the content in non-project format. Uh, there is a quick hotkey, Control E, which brings up the save file dialog, and then you can just save it uh, anywhere on your hard drive. You can just say uh, save it here, and I will just sa save it here. Uh, and I will load uh, and uh, select the D D DWG file uh, format. But here I actually already saved the previous uh, another project. So when I do that, uh, the software will name it accordingly. I mean, it, uh, the DWG file will get the uh, project name. And when I click Save, if it's a multi-story building, uh, after setting up the settings like unit, uh, file version, uh, all sort of conversion options, like explosions, how to sort the walls and so on. You can you can completely have control all over uh, these things. So when you hit OK, the software will uh, save this uh, content. And if it's a, a multi-story uh, building, it will automatically also create all the uh, uh, stories uh, as separate DWG files. The software will. This is actually only one uh, single floor here, so it was not uh, saved like that. But if I just do that from here, Control E. Let's save the uh, the file. So I just saved uh, one single copy, and that was only the 3D. So when I save the 2D, uh, yeah, it was it will be this, this name. Yes. Uh, then now it is uh, understanding that uh, I am exporting the 2D. So it has multiple floors. So uh, if I would like to save them as uh, several. Uh, drawings then now the software is uh, mm -hmm. saving all those files and this is also important what I just did that whenever you have a focus on the content now I have a focus on this content but previously I had a con uh, focus on the 3d uh, it makes a difference uh, so usually the software works like the you, you get as get what you see uh, method so yes. if you see the 3d content and that's the, that's active and it's supported then export will export the 3d content uh, when you are on the 2D and that is supported by that, that's a uh, file format. The software will export the 2D, so that makes a difference here. Uh, do you want to show us the DWG, or we can yes, go to the next? Yes, I think uh, it is already here, uh, so we can see. Well, it's a perhaps another. F uh, yeah, it's uh, sorry, uh, it's on the local uh, disk uh, here in this one. And uh, so the we, idea we had quite is a that, few. Yeah, we, we had yeah. we had more than a hundred shows already. <coughs> so yeah. it's hard. It's easy to get lost. So yeah, so it's here. Yeah, uh, so the way I see it, that every single floor is exported into a separate DWG. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, which is which is again cool what because you can yes. easily when you have a complex project with multiple floors you can easily you know you don't have to one by one export the content right. the software will automatically uh, save those into a file format now so much about <coughs> the the cad uh, imports there's one one another yes. thing regarding uh, the cad formats and that is the XREF. Uh, mm -hmm. Should we discuss that yes, now? Yes, let's, let's do that. Okay, so um, there is an important uh, way of um, how you can you can import uh, files, especially DWG files are supported this way, and those are the external references that will look the same, but it will behave a little bit different. Uh, let me show you what that makes uh, and, and how, how, it, how it makes difference. Uh, so I just uh, create an empty project again. I just save this uh, as a new project and now instead of uh, simply loading um, the file as a DWG file, I will go to tools and I will find an external reference option here and I will open an external reference. This external reference will be the one that I just loaded before. It's the same ground floor, everything is the same. So far so good, so that's the same story. Yep, that's the same story, I just open it. I have a similar way of uh, scaling, it's a, it's a different dialogue and now there's a big difference that there is, the, there is a reference to the original file. And this is, the, this is the most important thing that now when I hit OK, then the software loads this content and it's something that I can, you know, I can just use as a basis just like my work, before. just as before. But I cannot reach the content by default. I see. It's kind of like an underlay um, mm -hmm. under my drawing, but this is not the most important part. This is still in contact with the original DWG file. So Im imagine um, working together with you and you use uh, some software that, for example, you are the uh, MEP designer and you have the same building, uh, but you export uh, from your software, you export uh, something as a DWG file and you keep going, keep your working on this and you will make changes to this drawing. And then I would like to update that content. So classic way, I need, I would have to re-import that again. Yes. But now as I have an external reference to that uh, file, I only need to update this. I need to mm -hmm. import, uh, open the external reference manager and uh, say I would like to um, reload it. But now, before I do that, I will update. I have a newer version of this one. I will I will uh, load that and uh, exchange with the original file. By the way, the external reference manager is also here in tools and this uh, external reference uh, option will also bring up the external reference manager option. So let's just keep being here. And I actually have a modified version of this one. Uh, let me just quickly show you what's the difference. If I double click here, I might have the DWG uh, true view uh, from Autodesk. This is a free uh, DWG viewer, which I'm using to simulate. It's, a, it's another software uh, where I, I was uh, creating this one. It's, on, it's off screen. Let me wait until it's loading the content and so then I'll bring it here. It yeah. other, other screen. So um, there's this uh, content. Yeah, and if I just overlap it here. See now the difference here is that layout has changed. There, there's, there's a kind of difference here. And if I just uh, minimize it, you will see that the layout mm -hmm. will be different when I, yes. when I up, uh, upload it. So I just copy this and imagine that now you save this, uh, this content and I overwrite with this one. So we have a new version of this ZWG file with new content. And then when I click here and I click on reload, and then mm, I hit I see OK. That something's changed in the data, but yeah, now yes. it is updated. It has way more uh, data. Mm -hmm. You've heard a lot, so <laughs> there's there's quite a few uh, changes here. But this is how it works. Now it is a reference to this original um, file. So whenever it has any sort of change, someone brings in a new file and and up the, uploads it there and makes the change. I can just reload it and I can. Uh, use it uh, as, as still uh, being as a reference. Now, also there is a way, and this is the last word about uh, references, that you can also uh, kind of bind or open, so kind of make it completely yours, uh, mm -hmm. kind of turning it into an imported version. Uh, so all those other informations are for that. You can, as you can see, in this external uh, reference manager, you can handle many multiple um, form. Uh, I mean, DWG files, external reference, and work with, work together with someone like that.
Perfect. So let's now discuss non-CAD imports, which could yep. be <laughs> images and PDFs. So let's see a few examples for that. Because it, it might happen that you don't have the luxury <coughs> of having a DWG floor plan to work with. Maybe you just have an old, scanned, a very old copy of, of a floor plan. So how do we access that and how we process that? Yes. Uh, you have a very nice example over here. So this is a <coughs> typical scenario. It's scanned. It's in a good enough resolution, but when we are going to work with that, we are going to see the problem. So yep. how would you go about importing that drawing? Okay, so importing an, a JPEG file for um, being basis uh, for, 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 you know, kind of drawings or, or any sort of uh, images that you would like to represent on the, on the, on the 2D. It is very simple. You don't even have to open it. You can. You need to find it on the in the inside your file manager, and you can just click and drag and release, and then it automatically loads that. You can find the corner point for that, and you can set the scale for that image, and then the software will automatically place it. Now, um, even though this is a um, um, a two D drawing, I mean a floor plan of a building, it is not scaled. Just as you saw, I could I could scale it to anything, and but as this is not a vector. Uh, vector graphic content, uh, it is not having any sort of information about its real world size. So the first thing when you would like to work with the data like this, like, an Im like a scanned image of an old building, the first thing that you need to do is to, to calibrate the image, to, to set up a size on that and tell the software that, that for example, this from here to here is uh, 4.9 meters, for example. So to do that, you need to right click on the image and use the uh, context menu and find the calibrate command. And then when you click on that, you need to tell, well, I used to say that as long uh, is the, um, as the distance as you can find is the best because uh, it will uh, kind of dial down the bias that you will I have see. with this, with this, uh, In this, this case, content. This so this is the, would yeah. be a good way to go. So it's, what would you It's do? the best. So the, the first things first, the, the problem with this sort of uh, information is that you, th there's, there's no, no endpoint. So I have a bias here. I, I could click here or here or here. So that, that makes a few millimeters difference. Um, if I move my mouse here and I click uh, over here, imagining that this is the corner, then after that, I need to tell that the real world size, that this will be 4,900. 4, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, 9,400. And when I hit OK, then the software uh, scaled it up. And then now I can see it's larger and I can also uh, kind of measure it using this distance tool. I like it uh, because this is a very simple way of clicking into one corner, clicking into another corner and tell whether it is properly scaled. There Checks will out. always be a few millimeters difference because now I could click on a different spot of the same image. So that, that sort of bias will be always be there. But uh, it is still a very good way of di uh, processing um, uh, scanned data uh, of old uh, buildings and I can use this as a basis of my uh, of my work uh, from now on I use a wall tool I use I don't know a one layer 30 millimeter 300 millimeter wide wall and I click here and I just move my mouse I just change the orientation and now instead of clicking here this is the most important uh, thing when we um, process this sort of data instead of clicking here to avoid the bias but the bias that I would put uh, into this drawing by clicking, I just type the distance that I know it should be. Yes. So in that case, the, the wall will be uh, 4,900 mm, uh, millimeters uh, um, long, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the drawing will be kind of maybe maybe different uh, a little bit. So it's 2.5, uh, 2, 2. so it's uh, 2,500. See, see now I had an, an issue with my calibration. Yes, there's a few millimeters difference, but mm -hmm. from, but because I'm typing the values, it's it's not making uh, any uh, bad uh, impact on the yes. on how I and I and I can still recalibrate the drawing, but this from this point on, it's not that much important because I use this uh, drawing only as an underlay uh, to follow uh, the size of that. You're mentioning underlay, but it might happen that later on this underlay would be too um, strong and you won't see the numbers that yep. you're putting in. So how do you make it a little bit more or less dense or more transparent? Well, um, for that I will use the raster image properties. You can use this uh, setting for all sort of raster images. What you need to do is to change its transparency. So if you make it more transparent, and, it, and when you hit OK, now the software will mm -hmm. make it dim because now it's transparent to the white background what yes. we have here. So Perfect. it is uh, still there, but it's not that um, not that strong visual. 
I understand that there's another way to use images as well, to use them as materials, but we are going to cover that. Yes, later. yes, we will for, talk about for that now, as well. For now, let's look at a similar topic. What happens if you have a PDF yeah. format mm -hmm. of the very same thing? So how do you go about processing that? Okay, so, well, actually, uh, let me just uh, load uh, an empty project again for that, because that is also a situation which you usually uh, do at the beginning of the stage. You can do it at any um, stage of the, of the project uh, designing, but you will usually do this at the beginning. We actually have a few PDF files here. And let me show you what sort of PDF files we could talk about. The first PDF file I'm, I'm willing to open is, is this sort of PDF file. Uh, we will uh, talk about uh, floor plans now. So the content is the same, whichever I will open, but how the content looks like and how the content was saved is different. And this, this one is what we call uh, a vector uh, PDF. That means wherever and whenever you zoom into this PDF, maybe for a few seconds it will blur out a little bit, but it will, at the end, will always have nice and clean lines. This is one way of understanding this is not a scanned PDF, but a, but a, but a vector PDF. It was saved from another vector graphic software. Uh, so this is a vector PDF. We will talk about how to load that. But so first, see, let's see what sort of other PDF uh, file we could have. And this is the other one. This is a PDF, but just as in our previous case, this is a scanned PDF. Mm -hmm. So you can load this and you can scale it the same way as we loaded and scaled the JPEG file, the workflow will be the same. The difference is how you load uh, a, a vector graphic um, vector uh, PDF file. So I will talk about this. Let's see. <clears throat> to, to be able to load a file like that as a vector PDF, you need to go to file and you need to uh, go to import and tell the software explicitly that you would like to load it as a geometry, not as an image. By default, the software will load it as, a, as an image. So I, that's why I'm not using the drag and drop uh, method. So I just definitely say that I would like to load it as a geometry. And then I try to find this uh, file in my um, hard drive and it's here in the file imports files and uh, PDF. And that was the one. Uh, I, I, no, uh, it was it was this one, but I actually have another one. This is what I uh, like to use. This is also a, um, a vector PDF. So when I click click on this one and I click open, the software starts reading the content of that, and after that it will show me uh, a few things. What happens in Before, multiple pages, by the way? Uh, well, in case of a scanned uh, drawing, it will uh, ask for what sort of page mm -hmm. uh, you would like to load. Let me just this is, this is what I'm willing to load now. Uh, this is the original content, and this is also vector content. As you can see, it's always nice and clean whenever, wherever, whenever I zoom into. So I go back, and now the software understood the content, so I can just, the same way as uh, I load the DWG file, I can uh, just automatically place it. It will automatically be a group in the software, which I can explode uh, for my uh, purposes whenever I want. I can rotate this content, and most importantly, I can also scale this content. So when I see that, for example, this here, it is uh, 4,524 millimeters. It's also here in inches and feet and inches. Uh, then I can go and measure the content to be able to understand what is the, the size now, which is uh, mm -hmm. 45 so millimeters. So you have to make it 100 times larger. Yes, I need to make it 100 times larger. So to be able to do that, all I need to do is to go to the edit, and there is move, scale, and there is uh, 100 to 1, so that 100 times larger uh, than, than the previous one, and then you just click on the content, hit enter, and then now the software recalculates the size, make it 100, 100 times larger, Then when I zoom out, and now I check the size again, uh, going to dimension, measure, distance from this point to that point, so now that's the that's the size. It does so, check out. So this is uh, this is how it goes, and this is how you can scale a content uh, according to your needs. And from this point on, when you would like to turn those things into walls and uh, windows and uh, doors, you will use the same same uh, DWG uh, mm -hmm. file tools because those are the same two D lines as they would come from a DWG right. file.
So up until to this point, we have been using uh, <coughs> imports which were bringing us uh, 2D data. But what yeah. happens if you have three-dimensional data? And I'm thinking more about 3D models, yeah. the textures. How do you import them into the system? Well, um, when we talk about uh, 3D import, 3D uh, file formats that we would like to open into Archline, um, as we started uh, today's session, DWG and DXF files can also hold that uh, sort of information. Many times they usually actually hold it. But uh, the reason why I'm not really suggesting that file format when you would like to uh, communicate 3D models with textures and things like that is that they actually can't hold the texture information. They That's will right. only hold color information, but they will hold the, the model data that will be fine, but you won't have the original nice, uh, I don't know, fabric texture or wooden texture that you have on the original model. So for those uh, things, I would use other file formats from the, from the chart that which we show at the beginning. I would use 3DS, OBJ, FBX, or SKP. So a few of those we already have here. So let me just uh, load uh, another project uh, to place them in a surrounding. That's what I will do. We always say that there are certain things that you shouldn't <coughs> bother modeling yourself yes. because you could be obviously doing that. But instead, you could bring this data in from a <coughs> platform or from another yes. user or a colleague of yours. So it's very important to know how you can use the 3D data, which is already there. And this, in this case, this is what you are going to illustrate. Yeah. Uh, what kind of uh, project or, or model do you have for that? So I actually have uh, all those files in this in this here. I have a 3DS file. I have OBJ files. I, I will go with the OBJ because that is very well known uh, mm -hmm. just as well, the, the 3DS. Uh, so, um, and it holds an important information here, uh, which I can demonstrate to you. Many times, these files are not only one single file, but these are coming with the materials, with the textures, which are not necessarily inside the file, but those are next to the original file. So now, when I asked from somebody to send me the OBJ file, they also sent me the material descriptor and the textures that are inside that uh, model. So whenever you import a file, make sure that you have all the textures with that if, they, if it was sent to you, because otherwise you will end up with a model loaded without textures. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an important thing. Now, you can load it the same way. You can go to File, Import, select the file, or you can just use the same click and drag and release. And then the software reads that file. This is actually kind of um, a 3D uh, shape, a 3D shader, uh, which we will place in front of the building. And this is also to help. Uh, it, it helps uh, telling you what the original size of this uh, model was, and you can either choose to keep it or you can just go with another size if you don't like that. Now it, this is kind of six meters long and and two and a half meters wide. If I'm if I'm fine with that, I can keep it and I can, uh, and I can click on place, and then the software will uh, ask me to save this as a as a file, so I will just save it as, uh, let's say, it's for webinar. And uh, I will just save it into my own library and let's say it's it's the imported objects to keep it clean for now. And if I know the producer, if I know any sort of BIM parameter, I can, I can add that, but now I'm good for, with that, so I just hit okay. And then the software offers this uh, object for placement. I can either snap it to the building or I can just place it flip freely and I will just choose choose that and see now I have this nice 3D item. I need to place a few poles mm -hmm. here to support that. But now I have this three, uh, 3D uh, shape for uh, shader uh, here at, the, at this uh, part of the building. You have not <coughs> uh, mentioned the SKP file format. Do you have an example for that too? Yes, so uh, the SK, well, actually the X SKP file format is something that you can either uh, ask from SketchUp users or you can also download from 3D Warehouse, but for 3D Warehouse, we actually have a built-in solution for, mm -hmm. so I'm talking about the situation when you uh, could not download the file, the, the SKP file from the 3D Warehouse, but you get it from someone. In that case, you will get a 3DS file uh, as a separate file. I will just place it somewhere here. Uh, I actually have uh, one here in the SKP folder for this demonstration, and this one. And that's actually a plant in a pot. Uh, mm -hmm. just as the name yes. describes. Uh, this is usually only one single file. For So for in, in, uh, in case of an SKP file, you don't need to look for um, textures and, and things like that because they'll, those will be stored inside one single file. So I'm just simply loading that, releasing it here. 
And we actually end up with a pretty much similar uh, dialogue, uh, which is having an option here to switch between representations. Now it's it looks cool. It's 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 good enough for me for my purposes now. But maybe it's too large, isn't it? But yes, yes. The problem is that it's 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 kind of like ten times larger what I what that compared to what I need. So I need to uh, decrease the size. Kind of, and yeah, I think this is this is okay. So I decrease the size. I, I divide it by hundred and I say place. And again, I need to name it. I can save it into my own uh, library into this one. And I need to change its imported objects. I have something like that. And I can again fill up all the other informations. And then when I do that, yeah, I actually did this before. So I just overwrite it. So when I do that and I have this uh, object uh, at my disposal here, I can just place it. Let's just place it next to the building for now. And it will appear uh, there nicely. Perfect. On the side. Even though we covered this uh, a few days ago about when we talked about terrain <coughs> import, but we have to talk about again about how yeah. you can bring in terrain data, uh, especially if it's being stored in a, some kind of format that you can import. So what kind of abilities do we have here? Yes, uh, uh, we actually already have uh, a terrain here which was modeled or imported uh, quite a similar way. Uh, so I will show you here how, how it was imported. You can go to the building uh, terrain and you need to go to create and create from file. Now the software will tell you what sort of file format it supports. It actually has all the file formats here. Now for that purpose, you can import the DWG file, DXF file, uh, ASC file, uh, CSV, D80 or TXT files. Those are files that you very likely will uh, get from the uh, measure, the surveyor uh, on, on site, the site surveyor who is having a special equipment to, to measure the heights of the, of the terrain and uh, they can save it into a file which is very likely uh, any of these uh, file formats that then you can load and turn it into a terrain and this is how it works. Yes. Let's return back to the to the image topic and yeah, okay. discuss one thing what we haven't done so far. What happens if the image is not <coughs> something that you want to trace over, you want to use it as a material? Yeah. For mm -hmm. instance, uh, cobblestones or anything like that, maybe wooden surfaces. You want to use an image, what you found online or in any other place, and you want to use it somehow. Yeah. How do you go about that? Yeah, first things first, you need a specific uh, file, which uh, let me just load it uh, here, uh, it's it's, on, it's in another folder. I need to find that. You mean quickly. the images with the um, with the bricks? And yes, 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 yes. Uh, let mm -hmm. me just quickly find those. So what we are going to look at now is the ideal scenario when you have a seamless image where the yep. pattern is repeated perfectly. So if you would uh, put it out as styling, then the illusion would be perfect. Yes. So imagine that you have an image like that. We already covered what you do if you don't have these kind of images, but let's suppose that you have that. The question is, how do we bring that in and turn it into a material, something that you can use later on repeatedly, something that you can add to your own library? Well, uh, unfortunately, I can't find, so I will download one yeah, uh, from, from the website. I think that's even better because then we can okay. illustrate how to do that. Yep. Uh, because let's say that you're on the hunt for an ideal texture, and we are going to show you now briefly how you can find the right keywords. So I think seamless okay. texture, cobble, so, so on, yeah, something uh, like the, that. The, the words that you should use is seamless and texture and then what you're looking for so I'm, I'm looking for kind of like brick pavement mm -hmm. pavement yeah like that so software will uh, I mean Google will find or any sort of other search engine that you use will find a few images for you you can use <coughs> um, pages like uh, SketchUp Texture Club or anything that you you may find <coughs> or you can just simply go to the image find and find something that you like and then when you when you have something like for example i like this uh, or this or, or any of those uh, images i can just uh, right click there and say i would like to view this image and then now i see this image it's uh, it's now it's a quite a, lot, a small resolution so it would be better to mm -hmm. to get it from uh, from the maker itself but now i just use it as it is so you may have this image already you can uh, save this image uh, onto uh, your hard drive. Let me just do you save need it to, to the desktop. Save it or you, can just you don't have to save it, but is uh, it is uh, important that that you can uh, save it. Now I'm I'm willing to save it to be able to show you how 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 you can uh, just load that file. I think I will go with this one. This this looks even better. So I just uh, go with this one and save image as. So uh, well I cannot save it as a JPEG file. 
Uh, so you need to be able to save this uh, as a JPEG file on your uh, hard drive. Let me just let me make another uh, try, and if I uh, can find that, let me just go with uh, that one has a header. So that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not good because yeah. then the header will be part of the texture as well. So we are looking for something yeah. which doesn't have any watermarks or anything like that. So yeah, this looks better. Yeah, I can save it as a JPEG file. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's that that's that's what we look look for, and I save it on your desktop. Let's just uh, save it here, and then uh, I can just simply go and find this file, which is this one, and see this is the file that I'm talking about. And then I can just, and this is what I wanted to show you, I can click and drag, and instead of I'm clicking and dragging it onto the drawing, which I could do to do the same thing that which yes. I did with the so scan drawing. A raster image part of your drawing. Yeah. Uh, I, instead of that, I, I click and release it uh, here and the, the, the design center. And when I do that, the software understands that I would like to make this part of the design center, and as it is a texture, it will be automatically turned into a material. And now the software will uh, set up a size based on the pixels, but so it's not the real world size. The software is just turning each and every pixel into a one, one millimeter size uh, cube. I mean, a small uh, square. So you need to tell what is the real world size of this uh, texture. Mm -hmm. I will just turn it into, I don't know, 500 by 500 millimeters, like that. Um, and I don't have to name it because the file will automatically get the name of the image file. I can later rename it if I, if I fancy that. Uh, I can change the appearance to tell what is the look of this, uh, this um, texture or this material on renderings. So I can turn it, for example, into wall texture or something like that. Uh, and then uh, I can also uh, save it into my category and uh, to create a, a subcategory, I can, I can do that. And then uh, when I do that, the software will save it as an image. And from that point on, I can use it on my drawing, for example, here and go to materials, uh, my, and there was the, I, I believe I saved it into, into the other library and it's, it's there. So I click and drag and I just replace this uh, material on this object. So it will be uh, placed yes, over there. So this is, uh, when you already have files on your computer as JPEG files, you can just click and drag. You can actually click and drag multiple files at a time, and then in this case, the software will, the same way, will load all of them into the, the category which you choose for. This what purpose. happens if you have an <coughs> image of, let's say, a human figure and you want to edit somehow, mm -hmm. but you have to put it on its foot because otherwise it's going to be just a flat surface? So, how do you define sprites? That's my question. For that purpose, uh, I have this file here in the images folder, and it is this one. So that's a that's a person we have downloaded from this uh, brilliant site. Uh, let me just load this uh, back, and it's actually from uh, Skull Guba. This this homepage, uh, which is uh, which is created by a great person uh, sharing this this sort of uh, images for for architectural visuals and and, and for free different and for free. So you can just find these informations. Those are transparent images. You can use them for the same uh, purpose. I have actually uh, downloaded a sample from from uh, this uh, gentleman's website, and I'm using that for th this demonstration. So uh, I have this here. This is from that uh, website, and to be able to use that, I actually don't click and drag it. Won't click click and drag it here or here because I'm I'm not willing to turn it into a material or or a flat uh, mm -hmm. uh, surface, but I'm willing to turn it into a object and this object will be something uh, specially tall um, named as sprites sprites are like paper cuts so the software will understand that now when i browse for this uh, image and this image is in my folder here um, and in this folder this one and the files and images and this one when i click on that one the software will understand that it needs to turn this into a sprite and you can actually set up the height of this sprite, which is cool because this way I can find the best height for this uh, human figure, the same way I can actually load like trees and, and, and bushes and things like that. Uh, and I can also uh, set up a transparency uh, resolution and the software will kind of use uh, kind of like a scissor and, and, and cut it uh, all mm -hmm. around and this, this you can refine by changing the uh, resolution of this. And when you click create, the software will create a version of this. I will just save it into my imported objects just as I did before and I won't change the name. I will only type here webinar to be able to find it easier. And when I hit OK, then the software uh, will turn it this into a, a sprite. So now I, all I need to do is I go back to this uh, 
home page of the design center and I just look for skull guba and I think it's yeah it's double a double B. B yeah and it's him uh, so I won't need the material the, it's automatically actually turned into a material as well because you need to apply this material onto that paper cut but what you need is the object the 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 this one here so when you click and drag and release it here. Uh, let me just do that again. So I click and drag. See, now I'm placing this paper cut somewhere, like he's approaching the, the this porch, uh, the, the entrance, and like that. Now, there is a trick with this one. Uh, this will look cool only from this angle, I mean, the, this, this kind of horizontal level, because when you look from above, it will be obvious it's a paper yes. cut. But it is very, it is still a very good way to represent human figures, which mm -hmm. are very complex shapes. And those are those are uh, looking beautiful in the in the render as well. They will also always face with their one single face towards to you because there's no other information. That's just an image, but it is a very very good way to extend the, the visuals of the of this building or any any other thing that you design. That's right. And now let's talk about the what we call seamless imports. Yeah. Because so far, what <coughs> Ilish has been doing is. Uh, he was dragging and dropping files that we had in my hard drive. But what happens if you want to connect to external sources? We already mentioned that <laughs> Rushline is very open to other platforms. Now yeah. it's time to illustrate what we mean by that openness. Okay, so um, one and a, a very simple and very easy way to demonstrate that is to use this, uh, the 3D warehouse. Mm -hmm. Now the 3D warehouse is a great place to find objects, free objects that you can uh, easily find. Let, let me just find a bench here. Uh, to uh, place it uh, somewhere outside the building. You only need to find that object by simply typing the name, uh, trying to find the best one that, is, that fits the, your, your need the best. And when you find that object, then you can just click on that and you can download it and you can place it uh, on your drawing. Let, let me just do that. And you might need to log in. And this is what I wanted to, to demonstrate mm -hmm. here. So when this happens, uh, you need to uh, log in with any of your existing uh, accounts uh, or you can create a new account. I actually created a slideshow uh, representing that. So let me just quickly uh, go through that. So this is what, this is what happens. Uh, it's the uh, 3D Warehouse login. So this is where we are at now. So you will see a nice object. You click on download. It prompts that you need to sign in. Yes. And then when you click on sign in, you can either use your Trimble account when, if you already have, or you can just use the Google account that you I actually you did that. Uh, then you need to uh, set up your um, your login name, uh, type your login name for the Google account, and then you need to also type your password. And when you do that, when you hit, hit next, then you will be able to download this object because you will be logged in, as you will see your mm -hmm. uh, image at the right top corner. So from that point on, you can download this object easily. I understand that there are some other abilities uh, or platforms we can connect to. Uh, yes. Um, well, actually, the other other platforms, the most important ones are the BIM libraries, for example. The uh, What we talked about already in a previous session is the BIM objects. And I would like to also show you the showroom. The showroom is also something that you can easily find. And there are uh, manufacturers, makers that you can find uh, materials or objects uh, from several uh, different manufacturers. So when, I, when you click on that, the software will load uh, that library and you will be able to download either uh, bathroom accessories, mm -hmm. kitchen, uh, kitchenware, uh, wallpaper uh, um, or, or flooring uh, textures and so on and you will be able to uh, use them inside the software. We call this seamless because you only need to click on that, download it and use it uh, instead of you know finding something in an explorer and, and I don't know, download it uh, as a file. That's right and I think there's another uh, seamless import or rather export format which is the KMZ. Yes. If you could <coughs> talk a little bit about that too. What, what does it do? <coughs> Yes, uh, we actually have another building um, which we are, which we already saved as a as a KMZ file. But now I I will show you how to save a KMZ file for for this uh, purpose. You need to go to the uh, um, building and uh, Google Maps, and you will you will find this save three D as KMZ file. It will take uh, a while with this project, so we already did it with another one. So if you already have uh, Google Earth installed on your computer and you save this KMZ file off your model. You will be able to see it on Google Earth. So let me show you how that works. Uh, I actually have this, uh, I mean, another mo model saved as a KMZ file here. And uh, I mean, I mean, I believe it was here. Yeah, it, it's yeah. That, that one. Sorry, I can't the top see it. One. So this is the one. And when I double click on that, <coughs> now software, the uh, Windows uh, is loading Google Earth. 
and the Google oh, Earth. You need to have it installed <coughs> on your computer. Yes, otherwise course, yeah. it won't work. But you know, it's free to download and install it. So provided that you <coughs> have it, it's going to load up. So far, nothing special <coughs> happened. But what is the trick here? Is yes, and you need to have the desktop version, not the not the browser version. So now what happens now, actually, actually now it is still loading, it will appear here. And when uh, we have this model uh, loaded, as you can see, it will appear as a building. And because now I have this 3D layer uh, enabled in uh, the 3D buildings enabled in Google Earth Pro, I can you know, just rotate this whole thing and I will see this building with the surrounding. Mm -hmm. as you can see it and it's very nice and, and it's very very good for this sort of uh, presentation and the, the the quality of the data uh, depends on how the detail actually, yes. how, how detailed it was scanned so from a few angles it will look like a cyber truck but anyway uh, it is uh, how it is and loving it is the very, reference yeah and it is having a, a very nice surrounding mm -hmm. to be able to represent how it looks like you can also change uh, the uh, this, the sun uh, settings, the date and the time to, to kind of simulate how it blends into the original surrounding. So this is again another seamless collaboration with another platform. Yep. Returning back to the software and returning to one of our favorite topics, <coughs> which is BIM, let's, let's see how we can handle the BIM file formats by which we mainly mean the IFC. So yes. imagine that you get IFC data from another um, peer of yours, uh, another colleague. How can you use that data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that, um, I will load uh, a BIM data. This will be a, a, an IFC file uh, from another software. So to be able to do that, I uh, load a new project, an empty, empty mm -hmm. project, and I will load and we, I will import this data into that, um, that empty project. So I will use it uh, as a basis of my future work. So I will go to this uh, file and I have an IFC folder here and this is the one that I'm going to load. So I just click and drag and I choose import file and create a new project. I can also merge it with, uh, with another uh, file that I'm already working uh, on or I can import it as, a, as an object if it's only uh, furniture or something like that. But now I'm willing to, uh, to turn this into a project that I will work on and this is something uh, that was created by someone else. So this is how it works. Now the software loads the content and the biggest difference between an IFC file and the DWG file is that the IFC file holds the building. The DWG file holds the documentation, the, mm -hmm. the, the drawing. And the difference will be, uh, which we will see, see, see very soon, is that we will get the building with the walls, with the terrain, with the, with the slabs and so on, and we can continue working on that. We don't have to recreate this content. But the software will read this information from the file. I think that's the most important part. You don't yeah. have to <clears throat> manually cover these elements or convert them into Archland compatible walls. Yeah. Like we did in the beginning with the DWG, you don't have to retract the whole drawing, but yeah. instead you can use the 3D shapes and interpret them to what they actually are, walls, doors and windows and, and other elements that you can work with. Yes. So that's the model. <laughs> so far so good. So far there's nothing sort of special in that a, a 3DS or an SKB file could have done the same thing. However, if we go closer and we select things, we see the trick. So when you when you select these items, those are real walls with, with, with wall properties. You can change mm -hmm. the height, you can change the thickness, you can even change the layers. And the same thing you can do with all the all the, the, the slabs, for example, a few of the openings, and so so this is a, a way better, a, a little bit more rich uh, way of communication. The, the the thing that is missing from here, uh, and it is is natural with an IFC file, is whether it was annotated or if there was any sort of dimension. It's not coming through uh, using the the IFC file. So if you also would, would like to have that data. You can actually load the DWG file as well, but the whole point of this uh, IFC file is not to communicate the drawings, it is to communicate the building itself, and then you decide how you would like to annotate mm -hmm. it and how you would like to uh, add dimensions in sense. your solution, in your software, which in this case is Archline. So you get the building from the, from the, uh, from the colleague uh, who is working uh, with the software at which is able to save the IFC file and then you load it and you don't have to recreate the building. You already have the building and you can focus on what's important for you. Yes, and now we're talking <coughs> about BIM and IFC. I think there's another topic we should cover briefly yep. and that is the RFA file import. Yep. What happens <laughs> if you already have a file in RFA? 
if you have that file, we actually have that file, but we won't load it now because we, are, we actually covered that in a di uh, different session. You can also click and drag that file and uh, turn it into an object, a door or a window. This is how you can mm -hmm. um, process an RFA file like that. Also, when you download um, objects uh, or items from the bimobject.com, uh, those files are many times also RFA files that work the same way. The software will turn into a mode where you can just decide what you would like to do with that file and then you can go back to your original uh, drawing and use it as an object, a draw, um, um, an opening, I mean a door or a window. Most importantly, <coughs> you would not only get the 3D data but also the manufacturing data and the beam, yes. beam values and that's the most that's important, even more important part. Yeah. Uh, we opened this <coughs> section uh, saying that beam and other data imports. So what are other data imports do we have? Well, uh, we talked about um, file formats that we would like to uh, import as data. Mm -hmm. And for now, uh, there is one specific thing that is not necessarily a drawing, but is, is, it is really literally, literally some sort of data that you would like to represent on your uh, model. So for that, I, let me just go back uh, to the other model that we have loaded. Yes. And I will uh, place an information uh, next to this uh, building. And we actually have uh, something like that in case of the files and there's it is an Excel data so when you click and drag an Excel file uh, it won't be loaded like that because it is not supported this way mm -hmm. so what you need to do is to go to file import and you can go with an Excel table import because it is uh, treated dif in a different way you need to find the, the, the file which is in, in this case the room list and then you can decide whether you would like to uh, digest the whole worksheet with all of the data or, or only, an, only a range of it. I will just load everything for now. And I hit OK and then I place it uh, someplace here. So now I have this data, which is OK. I have uh, a few decks here, a few of the informations. But let's imagine that someone is working on this data Could be and someone yes. is changing actually this, uh, this data. Let me just load this in, in, in Excel and I will just change something here. I will just add the new information. Let's just uh, say that, for example, this here, instead of the value that I'm seeing here is, I don't know, it's, it's changing to, uh, I don't know, 10, um, 10 square meters larger. So when I save it, uh, then I can, now it is saved. I will, I will actually close uh, Excel. And I close this one. I don't need that as well. Uh, as well. So when I and I did that, I can click on Update Excel. So the software will well, perhaps I did not save that, but it will uh, it not, update uh, the, the content if I do. So this is uh, also reference to the original uh, file, and it will uh, update when you make the changes. Another file format or more like data import that you can use is regarding and connection with uh, lights. Right, so how mm -hmm. you can how you can bring in data and before you actually talk about that let's clarify why these lights are special well the lights uh, well first things first you will be able to find all sorts of uh, lights in the design center M make sure that now we are talking about lights not lamps lamps are objects with lights so when you go to the light sources you won't find lamps that you can place like ceiling ceiling lamps mm -hmm. or, or wall lamps those are lights that you can attach to a, a lamp body and then it will make up a lamp so uh, for that reason, in Archline, we covered this in another session, we have uh, quite a few uh, predefined lamps, uh, I mean, I mean um, light sources in these folders and one specific file uh, folder we have here and that's it, that is the IES file. You will notice that these IES uh, lights are coming with, uh, with manufacturer's name. And this is the most important with the IES uh, files. Those are files from the manufacturers mm -hmm. uh, coming from the factory. The, the manufacturers can measure the light sources, how they emit lights around the building and around the, the 3D space. They have a, um, sometimes a very, very specific uh, pattern how they uh, bright up the scene. And that sort of information is, is stored in that file. So if you go uh, on the website of G, you go to the website of the, the Kurt Vision, you go to Lithonia, or you go to Philips, you will find the most popular um, light sources are, are, are sure to be there in a free to download IES file. I actually have uh, one um, folder for that here, and it is the um, webinar 
Uh, let me just go with, uh, there into the file import files, and it is it is this one. I have a few here, mm -hmm. and I will just go with this uh, soft arrow because it has it has a quite a specific shape how it looks like, and I I, be, I believe we will be able to uh, differentiate it, it easily, here. Yes. So I just uh, go to uh, import is light source using this one, and I just find this same is file which is the soft uh, arrow this one, and I click open. And then the software imp uh, imports that, and but before I I'm uh, being able to use that, the software will uh, kind of create a rendered uh, view of that. So this is what it is doing now. It is loading the, the content and it's creating a preview of that. Uh, you need to wait for this only once, and now after that, the software will just simply list it mm -hmm. in the uh, in the left hand side. And when it's done, uh, we will see the preview uh, of that tiny thumbnail over here, and I can just use it the way it's supposed to use. You can attach uh, this to an object. What is the benefit of using an IES slide source? The, the benefit of using the, an IES, so th this is it uh, here, see it's the same pattern. Mm -hmm. So uh, the benefit of using this is a much better visual with uh, a lot more detail uh, and uh, it is actually the, the the whole point is that this is this is coming from the manufacturer so you can make sure that it's, it, this will um, light up the scene the same way as the as the one uh, light source that you can actually purchase uh, from the manufacturer mm -hmm. There's another topic on my agenda, and that is about the design center package, which is actually yes. the environment we are working on. Because it might happen that you want to share some data and content with another <coughs> colleague of yours, yep. who, who also has a copy of Arshan XP. So how do you get things from one place to the other? Yeah, well, let's imagine I have downloaded uh, quite a few things. You have these grenadiers here uh, yes. and, and, and guard robots. So this is or, why or... it's very important to catalog your your models perfectly, yes. because that's something I failed to do, and now I am keep bumping into these objects. Yes, so. yes. So imagine that I am willing to share this and this and this with you. In that case, I just I just kept holding the control key to be able to do this. So I uh, selected three items and I would like to share this with you. You are working on a completely different computer. So I can do that many ways, but the simplest and easiest way uh, at the first is that you can actually export this whole content. And when you do that, the software will export it in, in into its own, we call it environment file. And this mm -hmm. will store all information, all the textures and everything. You can actually also save materials this way. If we can um, save anything that we can find in the, in the, um, in the design center this way. And then when I do that, I save it, I just send it over to you via Gmail or something like that, you download it and you can the same way, you can go to the, your, your own design center and you can go and import the same content and, mm -hmm. and it will be uh, there in the same category, the same identical category where I saved it. So it will be uh, also organized at the same uh, subcategory. That's right. And the last topic on our, our agenda is basically how to work with point clouds, how yep. to import and how to process them. Now. Just a short recap about what point clouds are. Um, there are certain devices called laser scanners. What they do is that they are helping you to measure the built environment. Mm -hmm. So instead of just making manual measurements or using a handheld laser uh, pointer, and instead of just sketching out measurements, you can just put this device in the middle of the room and it's going to shoot out millions of laser beams a second and it's going to map out the building. Now, this is a tremendous amount of data and it's not really used for retail size projects, but only for larger yeah. ones. But we have one example here with which we can show you how to process data if you have that, provided that you have it in this particular file format. The device that we are um, we have been using is the BIK360, which was uh, provided to us uh, by the company Lyco Geosystems. And yep. the project itself was actually a very interesting one. It's a, it was a reconstruction project. For historical buildings. Yes, yeah. for historical, uh, historical projects. The Roman History Museum of, of Budapest actually invited us to map out one of their buildings. <coughs> mm -hmm. The building itself is a reconstruction. So it's actually um, a reconstruction of a building where Romans used to live. Yeah. And the task was to turn this into turn this built environment into an Arshan XP model. And that's what, what we did. Uh, I'm going to show you a slideshow. You are not going to get blown away with this because this is not that spe uh, spectacular, but this is what the laser scanner saw. So from the position where the measurements were done, this is what the laser scanner were, was able to see. Notice how you see uh, white patches. Those are the things where the laser didn't shine. So the, the device itself wasn't able to determine how, where these things are. Now, mm -hmm. you might see this is a plain panorama 360, but that's not the case. Uh, when those the, are points in the 3D, right? Yes, these are, these are points floating in space, 
where the distance between each other is a very valuable information. And I'm going to show you now real quick. What, I mean, what you're I told mean. it's not spectacular, but you, when you see it in 3D, it is spectacular when you, when you are able to look around in this uh, environment, as you can see, this is, well, now if you just zoom in or out, it will, it will kind of uh, reveal how, how 3D it is. Yes, uh, when, I, when I move around, I see that I have the ability to yep. move, so I can, I can look behind things. Now, since the measurement <coughs> was done from one single station and the device hadn't been moved around much, then yep. there's no data about these white places. But yep. these, these are the things for which you need human guesswork and legwork yep. to actually process that. But if yeah, I we actually created quite a few uh, photographs on the original yes. spot, you'd use that for uh, texture references. That's correct. Later. The reason I'm zooming in this much <laughs> is that you see that at some point the, the drawing actually falls apart because the, the density of the points is not, yeah. not large enough. But at the same time, I have enough surfaces to work with. But what do I do? Uh, if I zoom in, I see, I see the trick that this building is actually just one single room. And this mm -hmm. might not be the best scenario to demonstrate how this should look like, be because this is a rectangular room, but this is <coughs> perfect to show mm -hmm. how you can use a drawing like this one. Let's go into the split view where I can see the 2D as well. So this kind of the, is, is the top yes. view of this whole yes. thing, right? The device was here and it was sho shooting laser beams yeah. all around the place. And you see where it did manage to measure behind the chair, yeah. there's nothing behind this ornament, there's nothing, but this is enough for us. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we do is that we are going to isolate the things that we want to work with. Just make this model a little bit lighter. And we do that by clicking point cloud and crop. And what I have to do, I click on the model itself and then I'm just going to cut out the place or the part where I actually want to work with. So we like the unnecessary parts. Yeah, we are just off, going to right? ignore the things that yeah. we don't want to work with. So this are those gone forever, or uh, these are still referenced in the original uh, content? Temporarily hidden. I think there's yeah, going to be okay. a mm -hmm. gray underlay. You can see it yeah. faintly. Mm -hmm. So okay. the next next task is yeah, to sketch can, over the that. building. But mm -hmm. the problem is that now the software doesn't really know where and how to represent things. So we don't know where the but where the windows start and, and finish because there's, there are too many points piled up. Yep. So, and this is standard procedure in uh, processing point clouds. You have to make slices, vertical mm -hmm. slices with which you can isolate parts of the drawing. Yep. And that's what we are going to do now. We go back to point cloud, uh, clip from the bottom, and I just click on the mesh itself. And I'm just going to find a mm -hmm. vertical plane uh, under which everything would be cut. And I'm just going to make it to line up with the bottom of the of the window, hit enter. Is there some sort of ground truth or, or some sort of rule where you I should? I would say uh, don't go for a very thin slice because then you have uh, little information to work with. But if you have too much, uh, too large of a slice, then the information will be too dense okay. to, mm -hmm. to uh, process. Uh, and I repeat the same thing. This time I'm going to clip from the top. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I see this, this little happening thing. It shows me that what are the parts that are going to be visible. You see the, the, the thin ones or the, or the dim uh, parts are the ones which, which are going to be ignored and the strongly colored ones are the ones which, is going to, which are going to be included. So okay. I think this is good enough. I'm mm -hmm. just going to click and hit enter. And okay, now I have a clipped 3D model, but how do I make it into a 2D floor plan? Mm -hmm. It's simple, I have to uh, refresh the floor plan itself, which is going to be generated from the uh, from the 3D. I, from I the top view of what yes. we have. Uh -huh. Yes, I just have to click on the 3D to do that. Refresh floor plan, select the drawing. Based on that one, okay. And now I have a very isolated kind of, kind of view. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to rotate this, but I'm not going to because I have the north, di north direction in this drawing. Okay. So if yeah. I rotate okay. it, I lose that, that info. Yeah. Before I proceed... But you can actually measure the width of the room, the, that's the right. depth of the room, the placement of the windows. That's right. So if you want to make a measurement, you can do that. Notice that there are many, many points. Just in the case with the raster images, you have to make a value judgment in terms of kind what of, you yeah. want to measure mm -hmm. and how. So this information is what is most valuable for you to process mm -hmm. this data. Uh, another so we thing, can tell it's more, more around like four meters wide. Yes, of this exactly. Mm -hmm. Before I proceed with the with the processing, uh, one good advice is to make a 2D copy of this because later on this is going to be always updated. So if you want to keep this slice, then you have to isolate it, place as. So you mean image. when I would like to have multiple slices, I create a slice, yes. make a copy, make another slice, make yes. a copy, and so on. So this That's is what right. I repeat. Okay. I'm just going to. I, I have just copied this slice as a like an additional copy. This is just a yep. raster image kind mm -hmm. of thing. But now I have this to work with. And how do I work with that? I use the same tool as we used before. It's going to be a wall and I know for a fact that it's uh, 500 millimeters thick. Mm -hmm. And what I do, I'm just going to 
trace over the drawing. Again, the same way I did yes. uh, at the beginning with the other raster image. Mm -hmm. Again, if I do that, I see that, uh, let me just place this, mm -hmm. that the point cloud and the walls might not necessarily line up because the built environment is always irregular. Thanks. So it's yeah. your call how uh, accurate you want to be. If you want to work fast and you want to keep everything as a 90 degree, very clean drawing, then it's your decision. At, the, at this point, I'm only interested to convert a couple of walls mm -hmm. like that. Okay, but this is not sort of enough because I see that I have a couple of walls, but I have no idea about the wall heights and I have no idea about the, the windows. So what do I do then? I use the same tool as you used before, uh, windows by two points. And I'm just going to click on the two end points of the window just like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, this is still not holding this seal height information. So again, this is a kind of scenario when I'm in trouble to, to know where to start and where to finish. So this is something that I might want to clean up later. As and I the can. accuracy of these points are actually coming also from how uh, very well the uh, the laser could hit the point That's and right. what sort of surface it found. Exactly. So if how it's a reflective surface. Yes. It's a bit more. It could be off a bit. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. right. We are not looking for the exact, uh, because too much accuracy would give you too much data, and we don't want that. We just want to have a very general understanding of the room. Because yeah. if, if these things are not 90 degree angles, then it's only a laser scanner or a diagonal measurement that can tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have the basic groundwork. So what I'm, what I'm interested in is to refresh this back to its original form, because mm -hmm. I want to get the, the seal heights. Yeah, okay. So I go back to point cloud and reset the vertical clip. And I have to, yes, for this, I have to, again, uh, select the 3D, <coughs> reset mm -hmm. the vertical clip just like that. And in a couple of seconds, the project is going to build itself up back to its original form. Where so there are, see the full point cloud. That's right. Yeah. There are two things I have to work out. The wall heights, which are obviously not good enough, and the, and the seal heights. Yep. So for this purpose, I'm just going to, first of all, select the walls. I think now you have... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm keep hit, hitting, the, the, yeah. hitting the, the point clouds. Yeah. So, here, I'm just going to change the change height. height and just simply align it. Really. Simply visually okay. line up because I have no idea about the exact measurements. So I just have to do it this mm -hmm. way okay. by hand. I have anyway, some. you can change it later at any time. That's right. Mm -hmm. I have some nice internal views uh, saved. So I'm just going to jump back into the model. I'm look, looking for one where I see the, the windows nicely. I'm just mm -hmm. going to magnify yeah, this yeah. like that. And my task is to line up this window with this, mm -hmm. cut out this hole. So I'm just going to select the window, hit elevate. I'm just going to elevate it back. I'm this, working pretty yeah. fast now, so this might not be 100% accurate. And uh, archaeologists might uh, not be satisfied with my work uh, right now. But this is how you would process a very basic yeah. uh, window. And with, in terms with the other, you have two choices. If you feel that these are identical openings, you can just copy the properties or you can repeat the same yes, thing yes. And, and end up with the same, same result. Once we have um, processed the whole point cloud, then we are just going to texture the walls and add the objects that you see over here. And I think we have a finalized version for this project where we can show how the end result looked like and we can get a glimpse into how Romans used to live. So um, with, with your uh, tremendous amount of help with uh, modeling the whole building and many of the of the objects uh, we ended up with uh, a model in which we can show the very same room and yep. we are going to see what the end result of this work would be um, when it came to texturing the walls and objects creation that's something that we are going to discuss at a later sta stage in, in another show but this is actually the very same room um, just for comparison this this was the end result and this is how what we ended yeah, up with. Yeah, we used quite a few downloaded objects from the three uh, D warehouse. A few of these we modeled by ourselves, and we used used the photographs and turned those into uh, textures, into materials, the same way we just uh, told you uh, to to be able to paste them onto wall surfaces and to create this nice and rich three uh, D Roman environment. This is even not the final version. We have a we have another version with even more details. Uh, but this is this is this is what the next step was uh, the second or the third day after we made the measurement right. on, on the site. That's right. So that's basically in a nutshell the import and some export abilities of yes. Washline. We showed you how to import and process uh, CAD and non-CAD directories, 3D files, and essentially point clouds. So that's what we wanted to discuss. Yep. Uh, see you next week at the same time where we are going to talk about <laughs> other Arshtan-related topics. So if yep. you are interested in 
delving more into what Arshan has to offer, then we see you there uh, next week at uh, four at uh, four p.m. I think. Yeah, um, perhaps. Yeah. Three p.m. No, it's, will, it's, yeah, it's three p.m. You will be, you will be <laughs> yes. informed about that. Yes. So thank you very much for your attention. See you next week. Yes. See you. Goodbye. Bye bye.